Hello, I'm Bob Trubshaw, and I'd like to talk to you about dream incubation and some of the temples where dream incubation took place. Let's start in an especially attractive and steeply undulating part of the Forest of Dean near Lydney in Gloucestershire. In the 1920s and 1980s, archaeologists discovered the remains of a Roman temple dedicated to the deity Nodens. Current thinking is that these religious buildings had their inception between about 250 and 300 current era, and there was a refurbishment roughly 100 years later. But there was a serious deterioration of the structures after about 350 current era, so it was probably in use only for about a century. The Roman buildings weren't the first to be built there. The temple was built within an Iron Age promontory hill fort with dramatic views over the Severn estuary. Before the temple was constructed, the Romans extracted iron ore, although the workings were abandoned, presumably because better quality ore is available elsewhere in the Forest of Dean. We know that this temple at Lydney was used for healing, as there are numerous votive offerings, along with the lead curse tablets associated with Roman temples. Um, modern sensibilities regard healing and cursing as two different activities, but both require asking deities to intercede on someone's behalf. So, in a non-Christian worldview, they're just like the two sides of the same metaphorical coin. One of the buildings at Lydney is unusual for Britain, but better known on the continent, especially around the Mediterranean. Think of it as a guest accommodation suite with lots of small rooms. These are known to have been used for healing rituals, known as dream incubation. The Latin name for the buildings is incubation, the Greek is abitum. In this photograph, my friends Penny and Arthur are standing at the far corners of the incubation at Lydney, and the building starts where I'm standing. So what is dream incubation? Well, seemingly all humans dream, although not everybody remembers them. But when we do, we invariably try to make sense of the confused imagery and events of our dream time. It's as if our dreams are trying to tell us something. But what? Over the last century, Western thinking about dreams has been deeply muddied by the ideas of Sigmund Freud and Carl Jung. Um, Freud's book, The Interpretation of Dreams, first published in German in 1900, although the first English translation took until 1913. But Freud is really a Johnny-come-lately to this subject. The oldest references to interpreting dreams come from ancient Chinese literature. Intriguingly, they refer to people specifically seeking divinatory dreams. And divinatory dreams are widespread and well known. The ancient Egyptians record them, classical Greeks, ancient Hebrews, all the way through to modern day Muslims and Hindus. And I'll come back to, to this aspect later. The process of performing a ritual before sleeping, typically involving asking the deities for advice, in the expectation of the answer being revealed in a dream, is what became known as dream incubation. Often the place where the person slept was significant, such as these temples. Also common was the presence of professional dream interpreters, known as therapeutes, which involves into the modern word therapist. Note that in the Roman era, dream incubation was less a method of healing in itself, and much more a divinatory technique used to establish the prognosis of an illness and the best ways of alleviating or curing the symptoms. The therapeutes helped interpret the patient's dream. They did not offer therapy. Although many votive offerings were recovered at Lydney, there are no depictions of deities. However, the temple seems to have been dedicated to Nodens, as is referred to on a lead-cursed tablet inscribed in Latin. The translation reads, For the god Nodens, Silvianus has lost a ring and has donated one half of its worth to Nodens. Among those named, Senecianus permit no good health until it is returned to the temple of Nodens. Nodens is mentioned on descriptions elsewhere in Britain and in Gaul. He seems to have been the same as the Irish deity Nuada, who was especially associated with dogs. And among the miniature votives at Lydney are depictions of dogs, including a very attractive hunting hound. In Greece, there is a folk belief that the lick of a dog can heal a wound, and indeed saliva, both human and canine, has quite powerful antiseptic enzymes. Archaeological evidence of dogs is commonly found at dream incubation temples dedicated to Asclepius throughout the Mediterranean. This suggests, although does not prove, that dogs were part of one or more healing processes. There is no fundamental reason why the association between dogs and healing could not have been brought from the Mediterranean to Lydney, 
However, the links between Nuada and dogs in Ireland, where Roman influence was indirect, um, suggests that actually this custom was indigenous. Litany is not unique in Britain, as another Roman temple had a similar ground plan. This is at Thistleton on the border of Leicestershire, Rutland and Lincolnshire. The temple at Thistleton is located on a rich source of iron ore, which was exploited from the Iron Age right through the Roman period and again in the 1960s. Iron Age pottery and coins indicate that the site was important before the Roman conquest, with iron working always the predominant activity, although there is also evidence of religious activities. The first temple building was wooden and erected in the 1st century current era, then replaced by a circular stone structure. In the late 3rd century, and the same sort of time that the Lydney Temple was built, this circular shrine was demolished and a large Basilican Temple built, extending 60 feet by nearly 45 feet. Basilican temples are rare in Western Roman provinces and almost always associated with urban settlements. This rural example is one of the few exceptions, as is the temple at Lydney. The Basilican temple at Thistleton contained a votive deposit with a small inscribed silver plaque, dedicated by Mokok Soma to the god Veterus. Veterus is otherwise associated with military settlements, such as Hadrian's Wall. Outside the temple, and at right angles to it, mimicking the relationship of the buildings at Lydney, was a large hall-like structure which seems to have been an incubator. The remains of a surprising number of small dogs were discovered in the settlement at Thistleton, although there are no canine votives of gods as at Lydney. Later on I'll discuss the surprising coincidence that both Lydney and Thistleton are located on rich iron ore deposits. There may well have been other Roman dream incubation temples in the British Isles, although I'm not aware of them. The tradition may have survived, although not in purpose-built stone buildings, so any evidence wouldn't survive but there is an indication that similar practices were taking place in Leicestershire around a thousand years ago. The evidence is a sculpture now located inside the tower of the hilltop church at Breeden on the Hill in the west of Leicestershire. Standing inside an arch, a winged and robed angel is giving a blessing. Now everything about this sculpture says Byzantine. The arch, the way of depicting the robe, the hand gesture, they're all matched in mosaics and textiles which have survived in the eastern Mediterranean. The gesture of blessing is known as far away as Tibet, where I understand Buddhists refer to it today as Lassi Zunnu. The angel is carved at about the year 1000. It is most likely a depiction of Archangel Gabriel. Originally there would have been a similar depiction of Archangel Michael, and the two sculptures would have been installed either side of the chancel arch. Now look closely at the plants either side of Gabriel's feet. They're poppies, gone to seed. But the seed pods are still closed. This is not any common or garden poppy, those which disperse their seeds naturally, but the cultivar Papiva somniferum, known colloquially as the opium poppy. Every plant of this variety has been grown by humans because the seeds cannot naturally propagate. The Latin botanical name means the sleep-bringing poppy, as the resin exuded from the seed heads contains the analgesic alkaloid morphine. Morphine takes its name from Morpheus, who, according to Ovid, was the god of dreams and the son of sleep. The name Morpheus has the literal meaning of the maker of shapes, presumably alluding to the powerful dreams and nightmares well known to users of morphine-based drugs. Those who remember from The Matrix from 1999 will recall Lawrence Fishburne's character called Morpheus, whose name reflects his abilities at giving shape to what passes for reality. The Breeden Archangel sits neatly in the middle of the two millennia spanning Ovid and The Matrix. At the very least he seems to be the Angel of Dreams, but surely this is also an Angel of Healing, offering a blessing to those accursed with chronic ailments. The now lost sculpture of Archangel Michael would have reassured those about to die that he would assist their soul to ascend to heaven. And the location at the top of Breeden Hill would have also provided a head start. Later he was demoted to St Michael and became associated with dragon slaying, but that was still in the future at the time the Breeden Archangels were carved. As everything about the appearance of this sculpture suggests close contacts with the eastern Mediterranean, then presumably the practices associated with the Greek Asclepians, the dream incubation temples, were known to the religious community at Breeden. 
such a direct import of ideas seems more plausible than the survival or revival of an indigenous tradition, or well, that can't be completely ruled out. The earliest church at Breton is known to have been founded about 675 as a daughter community of Peterborough. This makes it among the oldest Christian sites in Leicestershire. They are commonly referred to by historians as minsters and provided pastoral care for quite a big surrounding area. The church at Breeden is now the parish church and is all that survives of a medieval monastery, otherwise demolished in the 16th century. The Anglo-Saxon and later buildings were enclosed by the substantial remains of an Iron Age hill fort on an especially prominent hill overlooking the Trent Valley. Much of the hill has now been quarried away for Dolomitic limestone, removing much of the hill fort and some parts of the medieval monastery. Undoubtedly the location for this 7th century minster was chosen because of the dramatic setting. There may have been some sort of Iron Age shrine with the enclosing ditch and bank, although if there ever was, then any evidence would almost certainly have been destroyed by either the monastic buildings or 20th century quarrying. There's no evidence of any significant Roman activity, although one bead, about 16 sherds of pottery and two pieces of tile do suggest a small settlement, but nothing on the scale of a temple or shrine. The general conclusion is that Breeden, unlike Lydney and Thistleton, there was little continuity of use from the late Iron Age through the Roman era. There is no reason to think there was a Roman temple at Breeden, still less one associated with dream incubation. Whatever the Anglo-Saxons might have been doing there was most probably not a continuation of older practices. Nevertheless, Archangel Gabriel's poppies tell us that during the 10th and 11th centuries people were coming to Breeden to seek healing and would have been offered pain-relieving opiates. These would minimise the discomfort of chronic pain and, in the absence of anaesthetics, enable the aligning of broken bones, cutting away of infected flesh, caesareans and other surgical interventions known to have been practised at that time. Then, as now, opiates would have been indispensable for end-of-life palliative care. Those who came to Breeden around the time the angel was carved would be seeking the blessing of God, transmitted via an intercessionary archangel. Simply being able to sleep inside the church, within sight of the Holy Sacrament, and hear masses regularly performed, would have been regarded as the most powerful medicine available. Any herbal concoctions would have been regarded as secondary benefits. If the patient's illness was terminal, then they would spend their final days knowing they would die within sight of the altar and as close to God as feasible. Then St Michael would speed them from the hilltop to heaven. Without any doubt, the therapists at Breeden would have known of the often frightening illusory world dreamt up by opiate users. But were they also therapeutes in the sense of seeking a prognosis or healing? Probably not. Within the Christian context, divination was generally frowned upon, including oniromancy. Any dreams would have been interpreted with a Christian exegesis, although very few homilies have survived from the time and don't give us any direct clues. The interesting dreams which were necessary for the therapeutes at Roman dream incubation temples to interpret were most likely stimulated by something a bit stronger than, say, Horlicks or even a cheese sandwich before bedtime. Medieval herbalists made a point of learning which plants were dream-inducing. Sink for her was renowned. Modern-day herbalists have confirmed that mugwort, chamomile, jasmine, rose, vicus bugloss, lavender, queen of the meadow, violet and loosestrife are also onerogenic. The herbalist potions prepared by the 13th century physicians of Mithvai come down to us in a late 14th century manuscript. The sources derive from widely copied Latin, Greek and possibly Arabic works. The concoctions include a cure for insomnia, opium infused in milk, and an anaesthetic, opium, mandrake and hemlock, which could be reversed with vinegar. Other sources from the late 13th century onwards provide recipes for a powerful medieval cure-all known as theriac. This had up to 80 ingredients. Some, like the flesh of vipers, were optional, but one was not. Opium, dissolved in alcohol, otherwise known as laudanum. The international trade of the early 11th century, which increasingly focused on Byzantium in the east and Winchester in Britain, would have ensured a ready supply of opium. Then... As now, opiates may have been among the most profitable goods to transport, as, as was incense. 
All the churches in Anglo-Saxon and later medieval times had substantial amounts of frankincense, myrrh, sandalwood imported from the same parts of the Middle East known to be where opium poppies were then cultivated. There can be little doubt that major monastic sites such as Breeden would have included opium on their shopping list of medicinal requisites. The presence of opium poppies in the depiction of an angel of healing really should offer little surprise. Presumably there are few, if any, other examples, only because complete carvings of 10th and 11th century angels are actually rather rare. Though the oldest literature in every society has references to the importance of dreams, Britain is no different, as one of the gems of the old English literature is a poem known as The Dream of the Rude, in which a narrator, later revealed to be the crucifixion cross itself, recounts a dream or vision of the death of Christ. In translation to modern English it reads, Lo, I will tell of the best of dreams, what I dreamed in the middle of the night, after the speech-bearers were in bed. It seemed to me that I saw a very wondrous tree lifted into the air, enveloped by light, the brightest of trees. That beacon was all covered with gold. Gems stood beautiful at the surface of the earth. There were five also upon the central joint of the cross. The later Middle English Arthurian romances used dreams, dream explanations and night vigils as, as pretty recurrent storytelling devices. According to these tales, the affairs of state in post-Roman Britain were often decided by dreams. For instance, dreams influenced Arthur's choice of Camelot instead of Cardor for his capital city. And when Arthur fathered his son Mordred, his murderer-to-be, he dreamt of a terrible serpent. There are some brief references in Irish medieval literature to the use of bull's hides by the pre-conversion priests who, according to much later medieval Christian sources, would attempt to gain knowledge from demons by spreading out the hide of a sacrificed animal, raw side up, on wattles of mountain ash and spending the night on or in the hide. We may reasonably expect that the lack of first-hand observation and some ideological bias in such accounts but divination involving dream incubation is also directly linked to ox hides in the Welsh tale of the dream of Ruanabi. The hero sleeps on a yellow calfskin which initiates an elaborate dream sequence lasting three days and three nights. And foretelling the f- future from prophetic dreams was also known in Scots Gaelic as Tag Um This rite was said to be performed by a diviner wrapped in a warm smoking hide of a newly slain ox and laid at full length in the wildest recesses of some lonely waterfall. Another reference to this rite being performed in the West Niles dates back to the late 17th century. In this instance, a man wrapped in a cow's hide was left overnight in a lonely place in order to learn from invisible friends what he desired to know. Uh, divination by sitting or lying on a hide is, is, is widespread. Going backwards in time, the Marius saga from the 13th century Iceland tells how a man sits on a freshly flayed ox hide with squares drawn around it until the devil reveals the future. Other sources tell of Icelanders who sit out wrapped in the hide of a sheep, a walrus or bull, to gain knowledge from the dead. This is the Icelandic continuation of the Scandinavian tradition of Utsetta, or sitting out at burial mounds. It's referred to in the sagas, although there's no explicit mention of hides. The saga Voluspa describes an unnamed Ceres who alone she sat out when the Old One came, dreaded of the Aesir. The Old One is clearly Uthin, otherwise known as Odin. The sagas also tell how Halbjorn acquired the gift of poetry, or sleeping out at the burial mound of a dead poet called Thorlifa. And in the same way, the Venerable Bede describes how Cademan acquired the gift of poetry after fleeing from a party and spending time alone in a byre where he had a profound vision. Now, Bede provides an explicitly Christian interpretation, assuming that Cademan had a vision of Christ or the Virgin Mary. But actually, in Bede's account, Cademan makes no such recognition Instead, Cademan just seems to be sitting out in a way which presumably was well established before the conversion era. A magical continuation of Hyde continues well into Christian times. Vellum was used for the religious texts produced in monasteries, especially the most important ones, such as Gospels and Bibles. The word vellum comes from the Latin word vitulinum, made from calf, and refers specifically to parchment made from calfskins rather than the hides of other animals. 
Now, at a time when all writing was regarded as magical, and the words of the Bible quintessentially so, the act of writing on vellum would have retained at least some of its pre-conversion significance. I've been reliably informed that the act of writing words or symbols um, on parchment to empower them with the spirit of the animal from which it was made is still a lesser-known part of Western ritual magic to this day. Going back further in time, many Celtic and Germanic cultures appear to have practised a curious form of dream incubation, seeking assistance from the spirits of the dead by sleeping near the graves of ancestors and heroes. In his book De Anima, the Roman historian Tertullian writes somewhere around 200 current era, quoting a report made by Nicander that the Celts sometimes spent nights at the tombs of heroes in order to obtain special oracles before battles. And back further still takes to, to the classical Greece of the 4th century before current era and the heyday of dream incubation temples, although many of these continue to thrive into the Roman era. Typically these temples were dedicated to the god Asclepius, also known as Asclepians. They were built at places considered to offer natural hearing and were usually associated with mineral springs. Seemingly every Asclepian had a special pit in which large snakes were kept. Now whether the snakes had a functional part in the healing process, or whether they were so symbolic, we no longer know. Tricker on Thessaly is the earliest centre of worship of Asclepius, and this became one of the most famous of the Asclepians, along with those at Kos and Epidaurus. Over 300 temples dedicated to him are known, and dream incubation also took place at temples dedicated to other deities. For archaeologists, the defining feature is evidence for the specially built dormitory or incubation, where the visitors slept and hoped for a dream in which the gods would provide guidance. Mythology tells us that Asclepius is one of the sons of Apollo. These sons each had specific aspects of the many attributes associated with Apollo, so Asclepius can best be thought of as an avatar of Apollo in his medicinal roles. Asclepius is associated with a number of animals, including geese, owls, dogs, snakes and moles. There's a rotunda-like building at Epidaurus known as the Tholos or Thymele, and it was said to be in the shape of a molehill. It was constructed above a labyrinthine series of concentric circles, and this labyrinth is frequently interpreted as a snake pit, but could easily be a symbolic mole tunnel. In practice, many species of snake prey on moles and also use their tunnels when hunting and as places of rest, so the apparent ambiguity is perhaps only a result of modern minds attempting to make a distinction which wouldn't have arisen in Greek thinking. Statues of Asclepius frequently show him holding a rod around which a snake is entwined and with a dog at his side. This combination of his rod and snakes has come down to us slightly confused as the caduceus. The practice of visiting Asclepian temples to seek cures lasted for hundreds of years, making this one of the last of the pagan Greek cults to succumb to the progress of Christianity. And the evidence suggests that at many temples his cult was just adapted rather than overthrown. A famous Asclepian was on Aegina, on Epidurus, and it remains of the temple today, although a large number of votive offerings, miniature limbs or organs were discovered. And just such tokens may be seen today in Greek Orthodox churches, presented by the faithful as a way of thanks. In the words of the arch-raconteur Lawrence Duro, Kos and Aegina seem to bask in the same choice, calm and smiling peace. Dora was travelling leisurely through the area in the late 1930s and early 1940s. He came across a museum curator who informed him that anyone sleeping on the Aegean Escapian would have confused and frightening dreams. Dora wanted to try this out for himself, but the outbreak of the Second World War required him to leave Aegean. However, he did visit Kos during the war and came upon a couple of soldiers camping at Escapian there. He stopped to share their brew and was informed that they had initially camped among the ruins, but had slept so badly that they had moved their tent higher up and into the open where there was more wind. Dora asked if they had any special kind of dream, but no, it was just something about the place that had made them feel uneasy. Seemingly, the Greeks acquired the practice of dream incubation from the ancient Egyptians, where the practice was widespread. At the base of the great Sphinx, a Stella tells us how, while still a prince, the future pharaoh, uh, Tetumuzi the fourth took a nap while hunting and dreamt that the Sphinx told him to clear away the sand that then partly buried the Sphinx. As his reward, the prince would become pharaoh. Even more informative is an almost complete papyrus known as the Dream Book, 
which provides an insight into how ancient Egyptians interpreted dreams. This papyrus seems to have been written between about 1275 and 1250 before current era, but may be a copy of a text that originated several hundred years previous. From about the 4th century before current era onwards, any Greek visiting Egypt considered it essential to sleep in a temple to seek a dream oracle, and the most favoured location was the temple of Seti at Abygos. The Greeks also visited the temple to Hathor at Dendera, the mud brick foundations of the rooms dating to the mid first century before current era, where the dreamers slept, have survived. And it wasn't only the Greeks who were influenced by Egyptian customs. The Old Testament also refers to dream incubation. Um, think of Jacob resting his head on a sacred stone at Bethel and dreaming of a vast ladder reaching up to heaven. Indeed, there's a long standing Jewish tradition called Shialat Shalom which has the literal meaning of dream question, although the prayer ritual is done while awake and asks for a dream answer. In more recent times, divinatory dreams have been part of Islamic practice. Indeed, the Quran regards the study of dreams as to be the prime science since the beginning of the world. Muhammad sought visions at the cave of Hira known to be haunted by the jinn of sleep. According to Peter Lamborn Wilson, the practice was formalised as Isi Kabara, which translates as seeking the good, although there's some ambiguity about this, whether this originally meant praying for a divinatory dream or merely praying for guidance. At the shrine of St George near Cairo, both Muslim and Christian pilgrims still seek cures by sleeping in or by the shrine. And the most prolific present-day proponents of dream incubation are Hindus, Every day, a thousand Indian pilgrims go to the temple of Shiva at Tarakiswa, north of Kolkata, to seek dreams that will cure their illnesses. And although it's not quite the same as dream incubation, vision questing is prevalent among traditional North American religious practices. Since the 1970s, these traditions have been appropriated by many New Age teachers. As a result, popular perceptions of vision questing are often very different from the wide range of practices among traditional societies. What is fairly consistent is that each tribe used specific places for such quests. For example, until the end of the 20th century, the Chumash Indians went into the hills above Santa Barbara in California, where there are hundreds of caves used to seek visions. Some of these caves also have extraordinary rock art and carvings, which uh, kind of attempt to, to record those visions. In a still unbroken tradition, the Bearbuck Mountain in the mineral-rich Black Hills of Dakota remains the vision quest site for Plains Indians. And rather interestingly, in New England, in the 1980s, two guys, James Maver and Brian Dix, compared an aerial survey of the location of native so-called praying villages in New England with maps of geomagnetism. And the correlation is rather impressive. Um, as if to support the links with geomagnetism, our Montville prayer seat in New England, erected after 1950, is located under a high-voltage electric transmission line, as if to deliberately use the resultant changes in the electromagnetic field as part of the vision quests associated with such native sacred sites. My own interest in dream incubation was triggered when I recognised that the two Roman temples in Britain with the type of buildings used for dream incubation were both associated with rich iron ore deposits. The Lid Lidney, Forest of Dean, situated on a hill that had previously quarried by the Romans for iron ore, and the Thistleton Temple was revealed of a head of a 1960s open cast iron ore extraction. And the richness of the iron ore in both these locations makes them geomagnetic hotspots. I do not have time in this video to discuss all the ways in which humans have been shown to respond to geomagnetism. On screen is a link to a free download PDF which does provide this detail. Just one detail to bear in mind. A few thousand years ago, the geomagnetic field was about ten times stronger than it is now, and it's just been fading steadily ever since. Um, just one final thought to part with. This video was recorded at my home. I moved there in early 2021. And partly it's only 15 miles due north of Thistleton, but it sits on the same rich iron ore deposits.